The Tom Woods Show, episode 1097. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, let's face it, the public school is the American church, and if you oppose it, you are an incorrigible heretic. Well, I've written a free ebook for all you good heretics out there called Education Without the State. Check it out at nostateeducation.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Very glad to be joined once again by Laura Blodgett. She is a very, very productive person online. She's got several really, really great and exciting online projects. And I want to talk about just a fraction of only one of them. And that is her ongoing series, 52 Weeks to a Better Relationship with Your Child. And given that she's a homeschooling mom, and in fact, she's done an episode with me of this podcast on homeschooling, I thought this is an opportunity now, even if you don't have kids, I guarantee you, you're going to want to know this stuff. And this is actually, I'm sure, going to be one of my favorite episodes because we're really going to be talking about some really, really important stuff. Can I say the word really a little bit more often here in this introduction? Anyway, of course, we're going to hit on libertarianism and parenting. But in general, I think there's just some good human interest observations we can make from our own experiences with children and young adults in our lives and the kind of questions that come up, the the self-doubt you sometimes have about what the right thing to do is. So this is going to be a great conversation, I guarantee you. Laura, by the way, is a huge supporter of the show. You will find her in the Supporting Listeners Facebook group, which you can access at supportinglisteners.com. She has been um, on the Contra Cruise with us, and she was at the 1,000th episode. So she is just top-notch as a Tom Wood Show supporter, and I certainly appreciate that. Laura, welcome back. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. You and I had a great chat the other day because, uh, I guess a year ago, yeah, you got lead pages through my link, and one of the bonuses was we would have a little, you know, a session where you could ask me questions either about how it works or best practices or whatever. And when I realized all the things you're up to, I thought, man, I— it's a crime that we're not talking more often here. So let's uh, dive into it. I love your series on 52 Weeks to a Better Relationship with Your Child. That is, first of all, that's just such a great, I, I think you come up with great email subject lines, which you've been posting <laughs> in the private bloggers group that I have. And I'm I'm so proud of those subject lines. <laughs> They're so terrific. Uh, you told me one in the call that I thought, darn it, I so want to use that. <laughs> Well, the, I said you could. The thing is, I can't think of an email to use it with. That's the problem. I mean, I'd, well, you just got to start keeping a list, and then you can go back to your subject lines and see if it fits. Exactly. exactly. So, so understand, it's not the moral problem of taking the subject line. It's that I practically <laughs> can't think of anything to use it for. Anyway, so uh, but I loved this I- idea behind this series, and there are obviously a lot of people interested in libertarian parenting, which I have to say, I personally am not that interested in. I, I, I think to some degree— it's a category mistake to try to mix the two things up. Now, I know that's that's controversial to say, but in practice, obviously, as you can imagine, we have the utmost respect for our children. I think that should be obvious when anybody meets them or when you see them, for example, at that roast of me at the thousandth episode. That's obviously coming from a place of of genuine affection and a real, you know, a deep relationship where where they know me. Right. And they don't just know I'm their dad and I'm interested in economics, but they really know who I am. And likewise, I know who they are. They're not right. just my kids, but each one of them is shockingly unique. And each one of them has strengths that I have, and each one has weaknesses that I have, and each one has strengths that I wouldn't have if I had a million years to practice them. And all of this stuff fascinates me. So anyway, I thought there's no way we go wrong talking about topics like this. But I, I, we will get into libertarian stuff, uh, certainly. But let me start with one that maybe isn't in your list so far. That And this is all going on at thehappylibertarian.com? Yes. Okay. Let me start off with one I was telling you about before we, we started. I am lucky that I have a good relationship with them and that they know they can say to me, even jokingly, Dad, this is the most boring thing in the history of the world. And you know, please don't subject me to it. Now, they would never put it quite that way because they're very sweet. But they know that just because dad wants to corral them into doing something, you know, it could be one of his harebrained schemes and they don't have to do it. But I still sometimes worry about maybe there's a chance. I try not to be too pushy, but maybe I'm prematurely introducing them to things just because for me, 
it's fun to enjoy the experience of them being first exposed to like Austrian economics or something, the sort of things that excite me intellectually. And to it's like the first time they hear a song that I love or see a movie that's very meaningful for me. To share that experience is one of the most exciting things for me about being a parent. And so sometimes I want to say, all right, well, now, now you got to hear Murray Rothbard. And I got to be, I don't want to, first of all, I'm not trying to make clones out of them. That's absolutely for sure. I don't want them to be little, little me's, of course. But the real thing is maybe I'm trying to direct them into things that are a little bit you know, they're just too young for it, I'm, and it's just my exuberance that's pushing them down that road. I don't know if other parents have ever had that problem or self-doubt that I sometimes have, and I'm curious about the way you think about it. Well, obviously, I think any parent with an ounce of sense has some self-doubt because we know we don't know everything. But of the dilemma or the stress of trying to figure that out comes because our way of thinking about sharing information with our children is so entangled with the idea of institutional education. And um, I actually just listened to your um, interview with Gene Epstein where he was talking about Noam Chomsky. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. Yeah, that's right. Yep. But he was talking about language and how kids learn language at such a young age without any formal training. Um, they get a lot of on-the-job experience, so to speak, and, and they're just talking to people. And I think when you are just interacting with your children, with life, with the things that interest you, and talking about real events, they do understand a lot of basic principles, and it's not nearly as stressful for them um, and it's more interesting for them than if it was being expressed in the classroom, which is a very false and stifling and tedious situation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that is, I think that is the right way to think about it. And, you know, because just the other day, it, it suddenly occurred to me that obviously I have some knowledge that, you know, as after all my studies, I've got some knowledge that I could impart to them. And generally I do so not formally, but just in the course of discussions that come up and when they ask me about things or there's an item in the news or we're on a long car ride and we have really good conversations and they ask me things and I answer them. Right. You know, and that's right. that's just a lot of fun. But then it occurred to me, especially because Regina, my 14-year-old, suggested it, um, because in the homeschooling for Veronica, who's just turned 13, I've been thinking, all right, now she's getting to an age where when I was 12, I watched the entire Republican convention on TV. Now, that does not make me a smart kid. It makes me a slightly dopey kid, to be honest with you, but I did it. <laughs> and it makes me think, all right, but maybe I can be introducing stuff like this. And she suggested, well, you know, Bob Murphy has a book on economics. And I thought, yeah, yeah, I know that. <laughs> I co-host a podcast <laughs> with Bob Murphy. So I think I'm actually going to give – I haven't told Bob this yet, but I think I'm going to give that a shot because she could just read the book and do stuff, but I could teach that book. Uh, just as easily. Do you remember, I, I can't remember, and I hate to repeat myself unnecessarily, but um, part of my schedule routine that I had with my kids was reading to them every day at lunch. Now, of course, you could choose whatever time of day, but lunch is a good time because they have something to do. They're not really tired. They're not too antsy from just waking up. And part of the routine that we got going was that I read an informational book and a novel. And so we spent, um, we read a couple, three, four pages, and then we discussed it. So it was very bite size. Um, it was discussed right away. It wasn't overwhelming. And I learned so much from doing that. Um, but also, I did that with all ages. And all of the kids were fascinated by it because it was so interactive. Yeah, 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 yeah. That is a good, I remember you saying that. And that really is a good idea. The The question is, what about the problem of the age range? How do you make sure that you're reading something that's accessible to everyone? Well, to some extent, as a parent and knowing your kids, it, the more you spend time doing this stuff, the more it just becomes natural to talk about basic subjects with them. You, you start to have um, ideas come into your mind like, okay, this is what has happened in your life, or do you remember when we made this decision or did that? Right, yeah. And so it's not, a, it's not, as, it's not as academic. Again, I kind of go back to that. as It's not as dry and academic as um, people who haven't done it tend to think about it. It can be loads of fun. 
I'd be curious, can you give any particular titles that you did this with that you thought worked really well? Well, I actually read Thomas Sowell's Basic Economics out loud to my kids, and their ages were 15, 13, and 12. Okay, those are good ages. The, the youngest ones, because those, those were the only ones I had home at the time. Oh, that's funny. By June, my three oldest will be 15, 13, and 12. <laughs> and the other thing about it that's interesting to me is that even though I felt like I missed um, economics in a sense with my older kids because I just wasn't as aware – we have the kind of relationship where because of my interest and enthusiasm, they all got interested, and it's like they never missed it now. Wow, yeah. All right, well, now, so now I'm wondering if I should do that with Bob's book. Anyway, I'll think that. I think Bob's book would be a great one. Yeah, I'll think that over about which what's the best way to present that stuff. But, but just keep it small. I mean, like, say, okay, we're going to aim for, it doesn't have to be written in stone, depending on your schedule. Say, we're just going to aim for reading one or two sections that are easy to discuss and you'll you'll cover so much in those sections that you'll be amazed yeah yeah okay all right that's really good that's really good regina by the way is just on her own starting to read these texts and i, I haven't even prompted her in that case she's just started to read them because uh -huh. she went to the mises university program with us last year right and um she met Carly. That's right. She did. That's right. Yeah. Your daughter. That's right. So, yeah. so she ended up taking the written test, and she did really well. I mean, she was at the time, she had barely turned 14, mm -hmm. and she did really well on that written test, even though she had to miss a few of the sessions because she was also doing odd jobs for Pat at the Institute. Mm -hmm. a and she just couldn't get enough. And she said, all right, look, next year, I'm going to master this. I'm going to come back, <laughs> you know, raring to go. And she's online yeah. looking at all the different things she should be reading. And, and the other day, I actually had to go in to wake her up. And right on her bedstand was economics in one lesson. I mean, she's, she's going through the stuff. It's, it's, uh -huh. uh, it's really great. All right. Anyway, let's talk about uh, things like how to guide your children. I think sometimes libertarians feel funny about this. They feel like I'm in some way, if not violating my children's rights, I'm being weirdly unlibertarian or something by giving guidance. And th this, I think, also, this comes through for a lot of libertarians who think it's unlibertarian. To t I, I, I remember being told by a former LP presidential candidate, they, they didn't get the nomination, thank heavens, but this woman said to me, said in a, in a YouTube video that she later took down, she said, because I was saying, look, libertarians and anarchists ought to do the following things. And she says, I don't understand how anarchist and ought or anarchist and should can be in the same sentence. And I thought, how do you not understand that? I'm, I'm giving you advice. I, I'm just saying, I think it would be effective if anarchists did such and such. And she genuinely thought that if you counsel someone, that's some kind of violation of the principle. Yeah. So if there are people who are that confused, I'm sure there are parents who wonder, how do I balance the desire for my, my children to really flourish and learn things on their own? But on the other hand, I have a bank of knowledge having been on this planet for a number of years. So right. how do you think about that? Well, for starters, you know, we're all sharing ideas all the time. We're all trying to influence other people all the time. We're trying to share our information, and particularly libertarians. We're sharing it because we want them to know things that are helpful. We want them to be free and to be creative. So why wouldn't we do that with our children? Why wouldn't we give them that advantage of understanding basic principles that are going to be so helpful for all of their relationships and for their ability to deal with life? Well, that seems pretty clear to me. I don't have any problem with that. So that more or less is, is what I do. I mean, there are times when the answer is just no about some things. The answer is just no, and right. they need that no, and it's wrong of you not to give them that no. So, I, I, again, I'm, I feel like I'm – it's not just dumb luck, but first of all, let me say, you can raise a bunch of kids all the same way, exactly the same way and they turn out differently. I used to think you raise them the same way, they come out as cookie cutter carbon copies of each other. I mean, you know, that's what I thought. I, what do I know? I, I was raised an only child. I don't know how that all works. But no, they get, they come out all different, which is fine. But there are also times when you've raised them impeccably, and yet one or more of them is just an incorrigible troublemaker. And it's not your fault. I mean, you did what you could do. And, you know, so I'm not trying to say that 
there's some magic bullet and that if you follow certain bullet points, everything's going to work out great. But at the same time, I don't think it's just luck. I was about to say I've been lucky because our kids are great, but I don't think that's just luck. <laughs> I, I mean, there obviously we had a little something to do with that, but I don't generally have to fight them. I mean, sometimes they are the ones who tell me, you know, I don't think we should watch this. This is probably not a good idea. And then I'll say, yeah, that's right. probably right. <laughs> I mean, it's right. just incredible. Their own instincts uh-huh. have been formed so well. Their own consciences have been formed so well that, and they know that we want what's best for them. And so they can kind of anticipate what we want. Yeah. I think that there are two keys that, and you say there's no magic bullet, but it has a huge influence. And one is that you do spend time with them like you actually enjoy being with them. They know the difference. And if you're just constantly trying to ship them off here or ship them off there and you don't have time for discussions and relating, you're not, you're not going to influence them and they're going to be influenced by the wrong things. Um, and I think they know that you are trying to do things for their benefit. It's You're not disciplining, you're not guiding for your convenience, for your um, trophies to be able to say that um, your kids turned out well. You're doing it because you care about them, and they understand that difference. And I think part of where people get, um, I don't know, confused is not quite the right word, but thinking that luck has more to do with it than it does is because Kids have a choice about how they respond to things, and the, and it's really important for parents to understand that, and that can be harder to understand when your kids are little and, and they seem so malleable by everything you do. Well, I agree with what you're saying, because certainly in, in our case, the kids know that obviously we want what's best for them, and that so far it's worked out pretty well for them, and they know that if they do certain things, they will have an advantage later. They can right. perceive that. They've got to an age where they can perceive that. So they're grateful that they have parents who are so invested in them that mm-hmm. they would do this. And and I also don't use them as bragging rights. I mean, I, I talk about them very tenderly on the show, mm-hmm. but not to say, uh, you know, look at their test scores and stuff like that. I've never talked about, not that there'd be anything wrong with that, but I've never talked about their academic accomplishments as a way of building myself up because I think that's... Uh, I think that's not right. I generally just talk about their good qualities. What impresses mm-hmm. me about them are their their really good qualities uh, that include, but are by no means limited to academics. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, all right. Now I'm now I'm going off on a tangent. Um, <laughs> I, I, let's say let's just say a couple quick things though about about homeschooling. Uh, we did an episode with you about that, so I will link to that on the show notes page. But for now, I'm sure there are a lot of people who want to do it and. They're scared to do it for a variety of reasons. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't, we can't afford to have a parent stay at home, or we have kids of so many different age ranges. I think I'd be pulling my hair out trying to make it all work, and I don't want to be up all night making lesson plans because I'm going to lose. I'm barely holding it together mentally as it is, and that would push me over the edge. Or I'm not qualified to do it. Where do you begin with that? With because those those are not stupid objections. Well, they're, they're based in their current perspective of education and what their life is now. There, there's not any really easy way to begin. I would say that um, when you spend time with your kids, it gets easier because you know what to expect. They're not stressed out from school. So a lot of the stress that people are feeling with school and education and their kids is a product of how they're approaching it and what they're trying to do with it. Um, and you don't have to do lesson plans like that. You don't need to mimic an institutional setting. Tutoring has always been better where you meet the child where they are. And whereas you will get resources and you will plan to some extent, you have the flexibility to go with the flow and make much more of the whole uh, process of interacting them, much like we were talking about just reading a couple of pages out of a book with them can go so many different places and just be so much more fun than having a curriculum. I I don't recommend people use curriculums. It creates more stress than it helps. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. But on the other hand, depending on what state you're in, sometimes at the end of the year, some schmuck has to show up at your house and look over what you've been doing. And it's a lot easier to answer that schmuck if you have a <laughs> portfolio of work the student has done that's systematic. Well, there are couple of different ways to approach that. You can sort of 
pretend in a, in a sense, or you can use a curriculum um, very creatively and, and, and use it to cover things without being bound by it, if that makes sense. Okay, everybody, um, shh, these are ninja tactics <laughs> that are meant just for us to hear. <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, the, the curriculums that they use in classes, they're, they're really trying to mimic a tutoring situation, and they can't do it. So, um, but yes, I, I think I remember talking with you before, and, and one of the first things that you should do is you should learn the laws in your state. But at the same time you're learning them, don't let them freak you out. Just look at them like you need to problem solve them. And then also find groups of people who've been there a while, and they can tell you the ins and outs, who to be um, careful of, you know, how to fill out forms so that you get the right responses from people. And some people can even consider moving to a different state. I know people have moved to Idaho just because it's a, a much easier state to teach kids in. Right. It's funny you say about uh, talking about uh, which person do you want to avoid and uh, all that, because I actually remember being a kid and uh, taking driving lessons and getting ready for my exam. And everybody would say there was this one trooper you did not want to get for your exam. <laughs> and they said, don't worry, you don't get that guy very often. Time for my exam. Who steps into the car? But and the driving instructor's given me the look like, eh, here's the guy. And they said, this is the only guy who's going to make you parallel park on your driving test. And doggone it, that was the best parallel parking job I have done <laughs> before or since what I did on that driving test. <laughs> so oh, good. Anyway, good. all right, that has nothing to do with anything. But but on the other hand, given that I have an almost 15-year-old, that driving thing's coming up a lot faster than I thought. I may have to have another conference with you when that day comes. <laughs> all right, so you were also talking before we went on about property rights. Now, how does that have to do with relationship with children and education, stuff like that? Well, I think that people need to realize that the home is a social place. And whereas all adult interactions, we talk about, you know, you can hire somebody, um, you get value for your money. I think if you think about it for a minute, you know, like if somebody in your family was sick, well, on one hand, you might um, need to hire some professional help. But when it gets right down to it, nobody cares about your family member and will monitor them and keep track of everything the way you will. You can't hire someone to care in a familial kind of way, in a parental kind of way, even somebody with the best of intentions. And it's partly because we are just finite people and we cannot spread ourselves that thin. I mean, I want to love all the children in the world. Um, and if I see them and I have them under my care, I do my absolute best to take care of them to that degree. But when it comes down to it, I am limited and I can only actively love so many kids. And I don't think you can hire that out educationally either. Um, so one of the things that's been on my mind, and I, I don't know if, if you want to let me go here or not, but this whole thing with the school shooting, and, and to me, the elephant in the room is... Why are these kids not being taken care of by their parents? Because nobody, I think most parents spend more time choosing a car they're going to buy than getting to know the teachers that they're leaving their kids with all day. Yeah, I mean, that is, that's without a doubt. You could just ask the teachers themselves. I don't even know these people, they'll say. Right. So in the home, you have a situation where the children are born helpless, I mean, nobody can deny that. They're born helpless. The parents provide everything. And up until a certain age, the children are not capable of doing much to, I mean, they can make a few dollars here and there, depending on the laws and the opportunities, but they cannot provide enough food and clothes and different things. They cannot protect themselves. So they need to be under the parent's jurisdiction. And if the parent has that responsibility they have to be granted a certain authority over the things that are the children's. They have to be able to say, this will or will not work in our household. This is um, not contributing to the overall well-being of how people are getting along or how we're trying to guide you. So um, children have to have limited property rights in the home for the home to work and for parents to do their job. Well, related to this is the idea that you're supposed to teach your kids to share. Oh. Now, I think I think you should teach your kids to be kind, 
and sometimes to go beyond what is legally expected of them, let's say. But I, I don't think it's a good idea to say, this is yours, but some brat is trying to grab it from you. Let the brat use it. I don't think that is a good lesson. No, and um, I actually just um, got rid of a book that was given to me because it was presenting sharing that way. Um, I've, there was a TV show that I was watching with one of my grandkids not too long ago that was teaching about sharing that way, and they just have it all backwards. You teach your children to share from their heart and to offer it. You don't teach other children to ask for what they want that is somebody else's. And that's what those stories teach. They teach other kids, you know, if you see somebody who's eating something you like, you ask them for it. No, that's not sharing. Laura, let me pause just a minute to tell people about GoTenna. We've all been in a situation where cell service is unavailable or unreliable. You're in a remote location, you're outdoors, you're in an emergency situation. GoTenna is the first company of its kind to use phones to communicate without cell, internet, or satellite service. It's compatible with any iOS or Android device, and it allows you to send text messages to anybody in your party, to send GPS locations, even when there's no cell service. Tom Woods Show listeners get 35 smackers off with promo code WOODS35 at gotenna.com. That's G-O-T-E-N-N-A dot com. Obviously, we could do a whole episode on any of these topics, but discipline how about discipline? Because we don't have to get into the corporal punishment question. I just mean on a, on a bigger picture, bird's eye view point of view, just in terms of punishing kids in some way because they, they told you a lie or something. And you, first of all, lying attacks the heart of the family. Yes. Because trust is foundational, and that's got to be a no-tolerance policy. Whatever it is the child did, there are consequences. And there are all different approaches that you can take on this. Yeah, and a lot of it depends on the child, too. It does. The child's temperament, some punishments are more appropriate to some children than others. How do you negotiate that? Well, again, if you are spending enough time with your children, they know that what you are trying to do is manage the interactions that have to be part of the family situation, and you are trying to teach them. And so it's That doesn't mean that you're not mad or upset sometimes, because sometimes being mad or upset as a parent is a signal that there's a problem. And so we shouldn't get overly concerned about that. We're like, okay, what's bothering me? Okay, I need to deal with this. And that's, again, it's a perspective thing. So if the child understands from spending time with the parents that that's the parent's basic goal, then the discipline is not exactly how you approach the discipline is not that big of a deal because the the child understands that you are communicating with them. Right, right. And, you know, I I don't know as much about it as I'd like because it's it's hard to actually find a really good book on it. But Mm -hmm. there is something to the old idea of the four temperaments Mm -hmm. that that there are, for example, I know plenty of people, I can't say their names because they would take it as an insult, who are, fl- <laughs> who are phlegmatic. They're not, uh-huh. they, they just kind of go with the flow. They're not the sort to get particularly riled up. I mean, we all know that sort of person. Right. Then, you know, they're, you know, the, the choleric people who are more um, take charge and whatever. I mean, there really are different temperaments. And, right. and really, a lot of times, the punishment or the discipline has to be according to the temperament to make sure that it does what it needs to do. So for some times, the, the punishment shouldn't simply be, here's something dear to you that I'm taking away just so that you can see the severity of what you've done. Now, sometimes it's so severe that that's got to be done. But other times, maybe you want the punishment to, so to speak, fit the crime. Right. And so we had something like this in the house the other day where one of the kids now has to prepare the lunches for a few days because it, it had to do with, you know, b- being with the family at meal time. I mean, it, it had to do with mealtime. Mm-hmm. So we made the so-called punishment fit that. And she is so at peace with it that the next day she... We had very little in the house because the, the, the cats ended up eating some of our cold cut turkey when our back was turned. So I, I said, we're not touching this turkey. So she made this beautiful platter out of what I would have thought was nothing. I would have said, we got to go out to eat. Mm-hmm. And she, she and she's enriched by it. I, th- right. this is am- I can't take her mom came up with that idea. So uh-huh. I can't take credit for that. But that was a brilliant moment right there in yes. the history of the Woods household. 
Yeah. And like um, when I've had kids who are, um, when they were younger and they are uh, arguing and they're being hard to get along with, one of my quote unquote punishments was you have to sit next to each other and learn to just like each other. And they would immediately start smiling and be best buddies. Yeah. That's funny. Jeez, Laura, it's, we've had such similar, I'm sorry, I'm talking more than I should in this. And I just, it's just because this hits me so close to home. Uh, but I can't help mentioning that we have two of our five who really were just completely at odds for a long time. There's a several year gap between them. And that was a bit of a obstacle, but they just were rubbing each other the wrong way. And we felt like the older one had a particular responsibility to be a little bit more patient with the younger one. Right. So anyway, after more or less kind of saying, okay, your punishment is you have to spend this time with, with her and do these sorts of things, they are almost inseparable now. They laugh and enjoy <laughs> each other, and it, it's something that we never thought we were going to see, and now we see it every day. Uh-huh. It's amazing. It's am- yeah. And that would, would not have happened without the correct kind of parental intervention. It would have just dragged on. Dra- this did not happen spontaneously because they rationally realized that it would be better if they got along. It was because we intervened wisely, mm-hmm. and th- what a happy result. Yeah. It's amazing. Yep. And we thank them. Uh-huh. We didn't just say, well, of course, it's natural that you should get along with your sisters. We sat them down and said, wow, we asked you to fix this, and you, boy, did you rise to the occasion, and we're so delighted and proud. Well, that's the thing about it, too, with um, guiding or disciplining or punishment, you know, whatever exact form it takes at a moment, is that you're always making mm-hmm. suggestions, you're always giving mm-hmm. opportunities to the children to respond. They always have a choice. Exactly. Yeah. All right. We're almost at the time where I would say, all right, you know, I think we're all done. And yet I think I could just keep on talking with you. I really could. I really could. But I think people should look at your series. Now, the trouble is it's hard to view all the entries in your series. So your (laughs) your homework assignment is to make that easier for people or to maybe or hire somebody or maybe even one of your kids could do Put a link to, in each, like in week 18, at the end, put a link to week 17. And then at the end of week 17, that would be an easy way that people could trace their way through all the weeks. Yeah. Or have one page with links to them all as you make them. Have a master yes. page with links. I have done things like that in the past. Um, and my oldest daughter and her husband are my my tech support, and they can help me with various options with that. But I, I will definitely do something. Okay, but in the meantime, people can go to the happylibertarian.com, scroll. First of all, you're not going to be unhappy reading all the other entries there, but scroll through and you'll start to see you've gotten, as of this recording, you've gotten up to week 18 out of 52 lessons that you want to cover. So you can find these, read them, and benefit from them. So the happylibertarian.com, I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 1097. But again, I think after this conversation, you'll also want to listen to our discussion of homeschooling specifically. I don't remember the episode number for that, but I'll link to it on this um, page. Is there anything else you'd like us to uh, direct people to? No, I think that's good for now. Thanks. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll put that up there. And I, again, I'm, I'm thinking this over. I just, I talk too much, but I've almost never had a topic that I feel so emotionally invested in, and so I just couldn't control myself. But I'll learn for next time, and I hope— Oh, I think it was a great conversation. Uh, thank you very much. I hope there'll be a next time sooner rather than later. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I sure hope people listening, whether they have children or not, uh, will listen. And, and I hope also that maybe even the odd person—I don't mean peculiar, I mean odd, like, occasional person listening who has always kind of thought— well, I don't think I'll ever have kids. I don't particularly want kids. I don't know. Maybe maybe just the way we spoke today, mm-hmm. I hope will will make them think again. You know, Brian Kaplan has a book with the title Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, isn't that great? He has a book called and he's he he's not coming from this from a religious perspective at all. He's very open about being an atheist. So he's not going to say you should have more kids because God told you to. Mm-hmm. Um He's got a whole book called, because he has um, kids and just absolutely loves them, and 
he's trying to deal with people who think kids are just a burden and they're getting in the way of my traveling around the world or meeting my life goals. And mm-hmm. he, he's just smashed a home run with a book. I just love blunt titles, <laughs> selfish reasons to have more kids. Cause it's actually going to benefit you to have more kids even. Absolutely. How about that? It's just it tremendous. Greatly enriched my life. Yeah. 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 I would be such a boring, I, I would think I was happy, but that would be the thing that my horizons would be so narrow, I wouldn't even realize the potential for happiness that I was missing out on. All right, that's enough. This is getting too sappy and sentimental, and <laughs> I got to go get my Kleenex box now after all this. All right, thanks, Laura. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. All right, everybody. Tomorrow, it's something completely different. We're going to be talking about differing views of the firm and of stockholders and stakeholders. The new fashionable thing is the stakeholder theory that It shouldn't just be stockholders who have a say in how a firm is run. It should be anybody with a stake in the company, and that could be people who live nearby. It could be your grandmother. It could be all these people. So we're going to talk about that and the corporate social responsibility movement with Peter Klein, who is an expert on the theory of the firm and on entrepreneurship and on Austrian economics in general. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you have subscribed to the show because think of how tragic it would be to miss one of these episodes. You will find the subscription links as well as a list and links to all 1,097 episodes at tomwoods.com slash episodes. See you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. 